Thank you for viewing this video brought to you by PCE's National Best Practices Committee and sponsored by the Carpell Foundation. The following presentation by former county prosecuting attorney Dan Satterberg explores the role of the modern prosecutor. The paradox of public safety is that the communities most impacted by crime are those that trust us the least. Uh, and when I say us, it usually starts with the cops, but uh, it, it certainly the the, the, the prosecutor has to carry a lot of that baggage uh, also uh, of a lack of trust. So doing things on purpose to build trust is a smart strategy uh, to get to a, a level of community justice where you can share power and do things together. Now, the, the five things that I always talk about um, with new prosecutors, first I tell them they've got, they're, they're way more powerful than they know. Number one, you've got prosecutorial discretion. You can decide how to uh, and your scarce resources and what your priorities are and what they are not. And you also have the power to convene. When you invite people to your office, even people who you don't think like you, if you invite them to your office for a meeting, they'll show up. They'll show up. And, 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 and so that's a powerful thing. And you're also, you're also closer to the money, to the government money than, than they are. And you may be able to help uh, advance funding for uh, some of these programs as well. So you've, you're more powerful than you think, even though you may not have 100% approval rating in every neighborhood in your jurisdiction. So the five things that I always talk about are to help reduce the, the footprint of the criminal justice system and help build community trust. This starts with diverting and deflecting cases away from the system. Now, diverting means a case comes to you from the police. It's, it's legally uh, uh, sufficient, but rather than filing it, you send that individual to a community nonprofit for them to be to work with both the victim who's been harmed and with the person who's caused the harm. It took us a very long time in King County to get that up and running, but we now have two really good diversion programs and Dan Clark will be your resource for uh, the adult one, which is uh, focused really on people facing their first felony nonviolent uh, cases, because we know what happens if we're after the first felony that the second and the third one come pretty, pretty quickly. And I've always believed that the community nonprofits that care about uh, working with individuals uh, are, have many more persuasive skills than, uh, than the court, than the prosecutor, than anybody else. And so yeah, it's a matter of finding funding for them. When I first started my very first community diversion program, I, took, I made a deal with the, uh, the county executive because our, our public defenders have a, a caseload system. So I can, I can put a dollar figure. If I take 400 cases out of a juvenile court, I know exactly how much we're saving in public defense costs. And that's just enough money to give to the community nonprofit so they can start doing this work. So there is money there. It's in the public defense budget, but it only works if, if uh, you have the, the ability to file the case or not. If the cops file the case, you've already incurred all those uh, public defense fee. So we have to take control over that. But diverting and deflecting, and deflecting means to me, like just not even accepting, it's more like what the goalie in a, in a hockey game does, like get that out of here. I don't want that case. I don't, and it's not, and I'm using prosecutorial discretion in a categorical sense. So for instance, many years ago, I made the decision not to file driving while license suspended in the third degree cases here. That's what happens if you don't pay your speeding ticket, which is a civil infraction, it's, and then you get suspended and then you get stopped and all of a sudden now it's a gross misdemeanor and warrants are issued and people are arrested and they spend the weekend in jail on a warrant just long enough to lose everything that they had all with the misguided notion that somehow this is going to get them back to being licensed and insured, which doesn't happen. So just as a, that was 4,000 cases a year that was in my misdemeanor system. Uh, and those 4,000 cases took a tremendous amount of, of uh, resources. And, and when you figure out the finances, you can go to your county council like I did. And I said, if I, if I don't file these cases, I'm going to save you $3 million a year. That's probably a close number, but since that was my number, you know, they had to disprove it. So well, I was able to use that in, in, in lieu of taking cuts back in 2007, 2008 in the Great Recession. They wanted to come after me for cuts. I said, well, rather than take $3 million out of my budget, what if I just don't do these cases anymore and we capture those savings and you can apply them somewhere else? So be, you know, be clever with the way that you can fund these things. End of the day, I don't know what the best um, policy is to make sure people drive with licenses and insurance, but I know what the most harmful way to do it is, and that's to criminalize. Often, they didn't even know that they had been suspended, and they didn't know until they got pulled over that they were now going to face really, for some people, years and years that of, of 
constant travel through the court system because you still got to drive your car and you're going to get pulled over. And now every time you get pulled over, you're going to get arrested. So look at some of these policies that your legislature have created and say, say, ask yourself, is that really the best use of our resources? And are we doing harm? Are we doing more harm than good through these things? So that's number one, divert, deflect, shrink your caseload to the things that you do the best. The second is to work to build public health responses to behavioral health problems. And we did that with the LEAD program here 12, 13 years ago, where we were able to get to find the money to find caseworkers, case managers, and treatment resources. And when police would arrest somebody for drugs, they would call a case manager. Within an hour, they'd show up and they'd be able to hand that person off for help. You know, that just makes so much more sense. And Gene's right, even when we were in the middle of the drug war, although nobody called it that, it was, we knew it was futile. And we knew that, that uh, it, it was doing more harm than good. So you have to build the instead. Your, your community won't accept the fact that nothing is going to happen when somebody's arrested for drugs. So you have to build the instead uh, and you can do it. And it, it, there's, there's templates for it. The third thing I think you need to do is just look at everything that happens. Once a case comes to your office, until the time that you've sentenced that individual and ensure that there is fairness through the due process, due process system from soup to nuts. That can include the way that you punish people as well. And, and there's, there's a lot of different examples for that. And since, since Kristen um, plugged her book, I want, I want to plug a book that I have a chapter in called Progressive Prosecution, written by, uh, published by the New York University Law School. And in there, there's a lot, 50 pages that I wrote about this. So I'm trying to to get through that. But there's a lot of things in there. But, but the reason that it's not the only thing that we think about, that's, you know, traditionally people think, well, when things come to the courthouse, that's your job. Well, the truth is, if we don't, if we don't look at reducing the number of cases that come to us, and also reducing the number of people who come back after we punish them, then we're never going to do anything about mass incarceration, never going to do anything about your prison population, because you'll continue to be fed more cases than you can, you can handle. I do think it's really important for prosecutors to get involved in prison reform. I think it's important for you and your assistants, the most that you, know, that you can do now, hopefully we're out of the pandemic, but to go visit the prisons and sit, sit in circle with men and women who are incarcerated and learn about what is what happens after the end of our litigation so that you understand what that's like. And it's a good thing for you to be able to to be you know, with other people and, and, ask, and, and be asking and demanding that the Department of Corrections do a better job because 98% of the people we send to prison are coming back. And whether they come back, and somehow we've all accepted that it's okay that they have a terrible experience in prison and then they come back more dangerous. That's sort of what we've accepted now, but it doesn't have to be. And, and it can be something that, is, well, it's not in your sandbox. For you to be in favor of prison reform is a good thing politically and, and it helps build you trust with the community, some of those partners who didn't trust you before, you might be able to link arms with them. And finally, uh, the re-entry process is the fifth pillar of criminal justice reform. We have in Washington state, we don't have probation, we don't have parole, uh, but we have a recidivism problem. We have about 30% of the people who get out of prison this year will be back in prison in three years. And so if we can do something to reduce that, then we can reduce the overall number of cases that come back we could reduce victimization etc and it's not rocket science it's social science it's harder the rocket science is just math uh, but social science means you gotta they that people getting out of prison need what we need and maybe a little bit more they need a place to live and they need some hope and they need some a credible messenger or mentor or coach within the community uh probation isn't the thing that helps people get stabilized it's it's support from people who are like them, who, who have been through those experiences. So for the six years or so, I was the co-chair of our statewide re-entry council. And the legislature created the re-entry council because I first convened a group of people who were interested in, in, in talking about this and what we weren't doing and what we should be doing. And so again, place where I met a whole bunch of people who didn't have a reason to trust me, but I was on I was on their side and it was a good thing to, to, to be talking about. So it's not in your sandbox, but it's good to play outside your sandbox. You make new friends that way. So all of those things uh, are, I think the future of the prosecutor is not just to sit in your office and process cases. You don't have to have community ties. I mean, the pay is the same either way, but if you wanna be successful and if you wanna chip away at, at the paradox of public safety where people most impacted by violent crime have the least amount of trust in us, then you have to do some things on purpose. You have to go out and make some new friends. You have to invite some people and talk about issues that may not be specifically due process issues in the courthouse, but are issues that matter a lot to people 
uh, in the community. And, and over and your, your goal over time is to build trust so that maybe when somebody is shot that they will say who shot them and maybe they'll even come to court and testify. I mean, those were huge things for a lot of people. Uh, they have no reason to trust you if you haven't done some things intentionally to build that trust. So I would encourage uh, every prosecutor to have a portfolio in all five areas, divert and deflect cases, shrink your footprint, build public health responses for mental health cases and for drug addiction. Look at your own practice, make sure everything's fair. Look at the prison, go and visit prisons, learn about prisons and understand why they can be better. It's not a secret. I mean, Europe does it way better than we do. Ours are still places that are largely brutal places where people get out with greater trauma than when they entered. And finally, be interested in helping people when they get out so that they have some stability in their lives. So those, those five things are something that you can have, you can have, you can have a, a different initiative in each one of those areas, meet a lot of new people, uh, and, and really in, enhance the public safety and the reputation of your office by being willing to share your power uh, and your problems with the people uh, who you serve. And so how did you come to, I mean, I presume you were not thinking these thoughts when you started 37 years ago. No, we had almost no community programs. We had very few ties at all. Uh, to the people that we served. And, and, and I saw as you know, we increased the prosecution for drug cases that went from 400 cases a year to 4,000 cases a year in about two years, uh, that the community felt like we were picking on them. And that you know, the last thing you wanna do is have anything to do with the prosecutor because they don't care about your problems. And so it just over time, uh, it, it starts with a, a couple of good friendships and you know these things move at the speed of trust, and so you you have to do some things to share power and to and to take your foot off the gas and not go all the way out on you know, on on some of these cases and look for other other opportunities. To, you know what I call building the instead instead of the court. Let's send them here, and it's not they're not violent cases. I think I think what we do best is to constitutionally convict people who have committed violent acts, and everything else. They're asking us to do that, you know, these drug, drug possession cases come to us, not because we're the best option, but because we're the only one that's been built. So build another one and, and get back to doing what we do, do the best and help people find money and convene meetings and stuff. So just reach out. You can sit in your office, uh, but you'll miss all the fun, quite frankly. I mean, at the end of the day, at the end of a career, it's those community connections uh, with unlikely uh, supporters and only people who didn't support who now our people I call friends. That's what has been really satisfying to me after all these years. 